My name is Kenny Dial and I want to welcome you to the scuba diving channel. This channel is for anybody that is aquatically inclined or just aquatically curious. Dr. Bob Sanders, the director of NASA's Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory, yes, the medical director of where they train astronauts underwater, is going to discuss his knowledge, his experience as far as teaching scuba diving. He's an avid scuba instructor. He's even busier scuba diver. He's been all over the world, volunteer for sheriff's dive teams. He's volunteered for conservation all over the place, including Antarctica. He's going to share some of his knowledge that he has learned along the way that has made him a better instructor, a better dive leader. Dr. Bob Sanders. Thanks for coming on. Bob it's Sanders, pleasure. now instructor. You dabble a little bit at NASA Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory. What got you into scuba diving to begin with? A friend of mine in high school, he had just gotten certified in diving and didn't believe that I was gonna actually do it. So we placed a bet. So I had to hold my own and go get certified. And that first time putting that scuba tank underwater, being able to take a breath, do something that all of my life I was told you can't do. You can't breathe underwater. Strap a little metal to my back and all of a sudden I can. I loved it, I was hooked. So my only option to keep diving was to take more classes, which was great. I loved it. I got to explore underwater photography, or dive rescue, advanced scuba diving. I took several advanced dive classes, in fact, in my career. The master scuba diver was a very academic and hands-on training. We broke down our regulators and really understood how the regulator worked. In your, in your master diver class, you took apart a regulator and put it back together. We did. The idea was we would truly understand what we're doing. And if you're going to wash the sand out of your regulator, sometimes you need to take the diaphragm out if the diaphragm gets folded or what have you. So to understand that really builds strength and confidence in diving. You kept going and got your instructor. I learned to teach really through teaching CPR. And I developed a passion for that from my advanced scuba class. And I started to teach and really developed a passion for teaching at that time. In addition, I was learning more and more about scuba. So it made sense to become a scuba instructor and share my passion for teaching with my passion for diving. Tell us about the first class. Did I open this up somewhere before? Because when I was a dive master, and helping out, everybody loved me. They thought I was great. I really got along with my students, no matter who they were. Maybe it was someone who hadn't exercised in years and was morbidly obese and wanted to take this as an opportunity to improve their health and explore something. And we worked great with them. Or a triathlete who wanted to see what was under the environment he was swimming in. I got along great. But my first class after diet, after becoming an instructor, not really the best references that I would have gotten. And I really don't know why. I think maybe I was a little bit concerned about doing it right, covering everything a little too rigid, and it didn't go so well. There's very few people I know out there where they did their own class, and oh, everything just went perfect. Uh, I know mine, I, I definitely, uh, you know, had some some pitfalls that I put, some some teachable moments um, <laughs> for us, teachable to right. us, not yeah. to the students. Yeah, which is usually not the way it's supposed to go, but it does, and, and it does make you it makes you better. But but you care to elaborate on that first one? I don't think I connected with the students, and I wasn't aware of my own weaknesses. There's a lot of rhetoric that comes with becoming an instructor, and I think it's important. There are definitely wrong ways to do things. There's right ways, there's different ways, and there's wrong ways. Normally I would operate on the different way. Because I wanted to be the best instructor, I wasn't so focused on it being okay to be different, and I tried to force myself a round peg into that square hole of the right way. I was working this weekend in a rural emergency department, and very sick person came in. I was sitting down to meet with the family members. And at one point, the wife said, thank you. You're speaking to me in a way that I can understand. 
it is so important that we never lose that ability to communicate. Is it possible that when we're in the dive industry so long and we speak dive industry, that we're forgetting how to communicate to people who are coming in from the outside? We think everyone should speak like us. We talk in these terms, and so we're not able to connect with the individual. But you even hear in a very open water level, you know, somebody's just getting certified for fun in the summer or whatever. But they'll walk into a store, and I've seen this happen, and they'll say, yeah, um, I just have two tanks I need to build. Oh, you mean cylinders? I can't spell cylinder. If I didn't have correct, uh, <laughs> autocorrect on my phone, I would butcher it every time. I can spell tank. There is this desire to, to use the proper language in the world you're in, so that you look like you know what you're saying. But it is so important to still remember that we have to communicate in a person's native language. English is a native language, dive speak is not, and failure of communication leads to so many problems underwater. You know, we had two of our kids were deaf. And it was really cool because you know how all the rest of us peasant divers are underwater. We're like, uh, over there, are you okay? You know, and we're all, <laughs> and these guys, I mean, they're planning dinner later that night underwater on their first open right. water dive. I'm like, they, they have got us just destroyed. That was really cool. It was interesting to watch them go around and point at things in the reef and just, you know, go to town, have full on conversations underwater. They didn't lose anything. Astronauts, if they're out on a boat, they're on a cruise with their family, they're having fun, they go to a dive. Right, just a recreational, good old fun dive, or a Cozumel, or wherever. Are they good divers? Diving is easy. Putting someone in a spacesuit that you can hardly take a deep breath in, that has very little extra space in it, that once you're off the crane that lowers you into the water, the donning stand, you are completely reliant on the divers. You cannot rescue yourself from the pool in the spacesuit like you can in microgravity. Becoming a good diver is easy. Becoming a good astronaut, becoming a good spacesuit operator, that's another level. You have to trust the divers that are around you because if there's a problem, you're not gonna rescue yourself. The divers are going to have to rescue you. What about the diver out there that says, I wanna be an astronaut? Diving will help you become a better scientist, a better physicist, a better engineer. I encourage young people to learn to dive. It gave me such a leg up in high school, in college, and even in a degree in theater, but the engineering side of theater, understanding the physics. Diving is such a great basis for so many things we would do. Then, if we're talking about someone who's aspiring to be an astronaut, the understanding of working in a weightless environment the understanding of life support gear and what it means to maintain that and set it up, the understanding of redundancy. All of those are themes that we want to have in our astronaut population and in space travel. What gets you excited still? I am perfectly happy, if I haven't been diving in a while, to get into my pool and play cards underwater. I love the feeling of weightlessness. I love the escape from all of the fast paced hustle and bustle that the world throws on us. I love the silence and the hearing my bubbles. I just love being underwater. I am so passionate about diving that anywhere makes me happy. So I gotta know, how do you keep that work-life balance? Because it, it looks, at least to me, like you, you, you have it. I have been so fortunate that my passion is also my vocation. When I go to work, I don't have to step away from that which I'm so passionate about, diving. I still can think about that on a routine basis. I met my wife scuba diving, so we share the same passion. Scariest moment diving. I was in Antarctica, and this was my first year down, and one of my early dives. And when I went inverted and came back, Cold water got into my hood and I got cold water in one ear, but not the other. 
If we get cold water in one ear and not the other, it can cause your eyes to start twitching and causing you to feel dizziness. It's called nystagmus. And I thought that was it. I was lost. I was under the ice. I wasn't going to make it. Eventually, the water in my ear warmed up, so the dizziness came off. I got back in an upright position. I realized I was looking up slope. And I knew I was shallower than where the holes were. So all I had to do was turn around and I could see exactly where I needed to, what I needed to see and I knew where I was at that moment. In the diving industry, in the diving world, is there something that's going on now, a commonly held belief that you just passionately disagree with? I love and respect that the dive industry is about being inclusive. I think though that we are not giving people the level of background, the level of knowledge that we used to impart on them. I think our desires to make courses quicker, easier, and shorter has also decreased the amount of knowledge we can impart. And by doing that, our divers aren't as safe, aren't as comfortable, aren't as competent as they used to be. You need to understand your equipment. You need to trust your equipment and you need to be able to work it even with your eyes closed. Even if you're gonna go in diving only in warm water off of a ship where someone else is gonna set up your gear for you. For someone that wanted to work as a safety diver at the, at the NBL, or maybe they didn't want to be an astronaut or something like that, what's one thing they could either just start doing right now or, or stop doing right now that would really help them get on that path? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go down and give you two answers for that. One, I remember when one of the astronauts was lecturing and was asked a very similar question. The answer was, don't try to prepare for a career that's a one in a million career. Prepare for a career that you love, that you want to do, that you're passionate about, that you can do. Focus on that, be the best you can at that. And then if the opportunity should arise, to train for another career or to apply for the astronaut corps, do it. And if you're in a career that you love, that you're passionate about, that you're learning all you can, that you can become a well-rounded person, a team player, whatever it may be, then you have a skill to offer when those opportunities come up. Also, choose a healthy lifestyle, a lifestyle that gets you outdoors. We need to make sure we still practice our interpersonal skills and our connection to the planet, to the outside world. So I think that's the other thing, choosing a healthy lifestyle, but healthy, not just physical fitness, but emotional fitness, interactive fitness, interpersonal fitness. You know, we've talked about a lot of end game stuff. NASA, the neutral buoyancy lab, being a diving physician, traveling all the continents. Those are the ends, diving has been the means. Enjoy it. Get out and do more. It is such a great opportunity to stay fit. It is such a great opportunity to meet people. It is just, it's a fantastic world. So embrace your passion. It will open up doors for you. If you want the full length uncensored interview, go to sweetwaterscuba.com.